Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined for a second time by Dr. David Papineau. He's Professor of Philosophy at King's College London, and today we're going to talk about his new book, The Metaphysics of Sensory Experience. So Dr. Papineau, welcome to the show. It's again a pleasure to everyone. Thank you very much for having me on again. It's nice to be here. Okay, great. So, uh, first of all, because we are uh, dealing with things here from a philosophical perspective, what is sensory experience? Oh, uh, sensory experience is just uh, your conscious awareness of the world around you through your senses. And we talk about the five five familiar senses, uh, seeing, touching, smelling, hearing, tasting, but maybe there's more, maybe there's just uh, one big sense all muddled up together, but however you think about that, that's that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the, the conscious awareness you have through your senses. So you, I mean, I look around, I can see the car outside, I can see the, the trees, uh, I can see the colors and the shapes, and I can feel the feel the, the chair I'm sitting on and so on that's all that's all sensory experience conscious sensory experience and, and I'm interested especially in, in, in the, the fact that it's 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 conscious I mean I'm interested in the conscious elements of sensory experience mm -hmm. the conscious elements but there are also unconscious elements of sensory experience yes I mean there's quite a lively little debate among philosophers of perception especially scientifically orientated philosophy of perception about whether there's such a thing as unconscious perception and I have no strong views about that I mean certainly uh, information comes in through the, the sense organs that influences our behavior that's not not conscious whether it's uh, organized systematic uh, enough to be perception I don't mind I mean, I'm not I'm not involved in that debate I mean and when I talk about sensory experience I just mean by definition conscious sensory experience whether there's other uh, similar things going on that are unconscious that's of no great concern to me for the purposes of this book mm -hmm. and how would you classify things like illusions would you call them false sensory experiences yes yes I'm uh, 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 certainly illusory experiences and hallucinatory experiences are sensory experiences in in my sense right so I said sensory experience is is your conscious awareness of the world around you but sometimes uh, you're in uh, similar seeming conscious states where you've got the world wrong so you aren't successfully aware of the world around you and those are illusions when you misperceive the color or shape of something or hallucinations when you mistakenly think there's something there when there's nothing there at all and we'll talk quite a lot about I think representationalism as a position in the philosophy of perception and I'm, I'm uh, very suspicious of, of many of the the theses that representationalists hold but but I certainly do think that sensory experiences are representations they do represent the world to be a certain way and illusions are and hallucinations are just the cases where you have a sensory experience but the way it's representing the world to be does not obtain so you know I see my my car to be blue and in fact it's gray so I'm having an illusion or Maybe I've been ingesting some interesting substances and I see my car to be there and it's not there at all. That's an hallucination. But I mean, what picks them out is just what they're saying about the world, so to speak, isn't, isn't the case. Mm -hmm. But the kinds of representations we have in our minds, I mean, do they have anything directly to do with the features of the objects we see, for example, or, or is it mostly about the intrinsic properties of, our, of how our brains work? So perhaps I should say something about representation and how representationalists in the philosophy of perception think about this and how I think about about this 
So I have no doubt that sensory experiences are representations. We're just talking about illusions and hallucinations as false sensory representations. So I think you can uh, consider somebody who's seeing their car to be blue or whatever. They're in a state which represents the world to be a certain way. And that's a kind of minimal representationism about sensory experiences. Sensory experiences do represent the world. There are philosophers of perception, we might come back to this, who don't accept that. They think it's a more direct relation than an realist, but pretty much the standard view is that uh, sensory experiences represent the world to subjects and they lead the subjects to behave in a way appropriate to the world being a certain way. They seem to they seem to satisfy all the all the requirements of being representations. But representationalists in the philosophy of perception have a view which is much stronger than just that experiences are representations. They think experiences are essentially representational. They think it just falls out of the conscious nature of experiences that they represent what they do. That somehow they're intrinsically representational. And I don't accept that at all. I think that sense experiences are contingently representational. I mean, perhaps accidentally representational is a bit strong, but contingently representational. And here's, here's the, the natural analogy to bring out my idea. So the words in a language, the words of English that I'm now speaking, they, they represent things to be thus and so. If I say in English, my car is blue, I'm representing that my car is blue. Actually, it isn't. It's great. So I'm representing falsely, but still I'm representing using the words. But if you think of the words themselves as just sounds that I'm making or marks on paper, those sounds or marks on paper aren't intrinsically representational. It's not, it's not built into their nature as marks on paper or sounds in the air that they say what they do or that they say anything at all. I mean, we could imagine that English should work differently and that they meant something different or that there wasn't any English. They didn't mean anything, anything at all. So that's how I think about sensory experiences. So okay, the, the words represent because of the way they're used in English. I think our sensory experiences represent not because of the way they're used by some language community, that's the, uh, but not because of their nature in themselves. I think they represent because of the way they're correlated with features of our environment by our histories, our evolutionary history, our learning and so on. And so certain internal states get to be correlated with features of the environment. And therefore we can use them as kind of proxies for those feature environment in guiding our behavior. But they're no more intrinsically connected to those features of the environment than the words of English are. Uh, slightly different, they're connected by their environmental correlations, by the way they're correlated, by the way they tend to co-vary, by they're normally produced by these features of the environment. Uh, but we could imagine that just those same sensory experiences were correlated with different features. Maybe evolution might have wired us up differently. So the brain states that represent green, represent red things or or maybe we could imagine some accidental cosmic brain in a vat that just coagulates out in space physically just like me i think it will have the same experiences but its experiences won't be correlated with any features of the environment uh, so i would say they wouldn't be representing at all so that's how i think about it i think that they're contingent representations like the words of a language which aren't intrinsically meaningful but meaningful in a way in a sense because of the way they're used mm -hmm. but the representationalists in the philosophy of perception they have a much stronger view they think that uh it's built in to the conscious nature of our experiences that they represent what they do that they don't need any uh, correlations with the environment. You don't need any evolutionary history or anything like that. Just look at the experiences, look at their conscious nature, and you can kind of read off from that what they represent. Uh, um, the 
the representations of foster perception will say that the, the cosmic brain and the vat, insofar as they agree that uh, it's, it's conscious just like me, will say it will be representing things just like me. It will be representing that there's a tomato in front of it that's green and so on, just because that's built into the conscious nature. And I grant you that this representationalism, this let's call it, let's from now on use representationalism to mean representationalism in the philosophy of perception, i.e. essential, essential representationalism. I grant it's a very natural view. I grant that when you kind of introspect your experience, you feel, look, I can, I can just see that this is telling me there's a, a blue car there or a red tomato or something. Uh, I don't need to know anything about correlations. It's just there in the experience. But I think that's a mistaken view, and I think it doesn't really make any sense when you look at it more closely. Mm -hmm. But ca can we say anything about uh, if we really represent the world as it is? Does that question matter here? Not really. I, uh, we don't need to get too deep into that. Uh, we, we can talk about the manifest image as the way the world is presented to us in experience and contrast that with the scientific image, the way that the world is described by science. And we might worry about how far science vindicates the picture of the world that we get from experience. But that's kind of pretty independent of what I'm worried about in in this book. Let's suppose that, you know, that there's uh, physical objects and cars and shapes and uh, colors and textures and so on and let's not worry too much about whether we're thinking of those in some kind of common sense way or some scientific way i mean either way we can think that our experiences represent shapes and textures and colors and so on uh, kinds of objects maybe uh, and then we can ask do they represent those things contingently in the in virtue of the way that we somehow use the experiences in, in indicating features of the environment, or do they represent intrinsically in virtue of the conscious nature of the experience? So, so that question about, you know, is the world really like we see it? It's kind of an interesting question, but independent to what I'm, I'm thinking, thinking about. So you asked earlier, do I think that these experiences are just can't remember how you put it. Intrinsic qualitative features of of me. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. I. I mean, as it happens, I'm a physicalist, so I think the experiences are brain states. But that's not a big feature of the book. I mean, I could have written pretty much all the book even if I wasn't a physicalist. The important thing is that they're kind of internal, uh, intrinsic features of me. They don't depend on my environment. They don't depend on how. I'm related to the, the rest of the world. Uh, it's only because of the way they're embedded in the world that they get to represent. They don't represent in their own right, as it were. Now, I find the, the history and sociology of the subject rather odd, because while the view I'm presenting is kind of a bit odd and counterintuitive, I also think it's the standard scientific view, the standard view in a lot of the history of uh, modern Western philosophy, it's a standard view any intelligent teenager would come to that there are these things inside your head and they're not intrinsically connected, essentially connected with the rest of the world. And somehow they kind of give you uh, uh, some guide to how the world is. This is the standard scientific view. And the funny thing is that somehow in the philosophy of perception, that standard view has been sidelined as somehow too vulgar and silly and uh, uh, we should have more sophisticated views that make make experiences in a way more more magical and maybe it's that people working in the philosophy of perception aren't particularly concerned to get their views to square with science and I've come along and said, no, no, I mean, if, you, if you're thinking seriously from a scientific point of view, you've got to have a different view about 
sensory experiences. I don't know. I mean, now, now I say that. I mean, plenty of people who work in philosophy of perception are perfectly uh, familiar with science and, and concerned to respect it. It's, it's a puzzle to me that, that my view is so much a, a minority one. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, in the book, of course, uh, according to the title, you focus on the metaphysics of sensory experience, but do you have anything to say about epistemology or do you link it with it? Because I was just thinking that perhaps uh, if we understand how we represent the world, we can also have something to say about what we can learn about it. I don't say very much about epistemology in the book at all. And that's maybe a bit different from many people working in the philosophy of perception. And many of them are concerned to understand perception because they're concerned to show that given their understanding of perception, that's how we get to know about the world. That's how we get to have justified beliefs. That's how we get even perhaps some philosophers argue just to be able to refer to things in the world depends on on our having some kind of perceptual contact with the world and for many people the drive look, let, let, let me let me put it just step back a bit and, and the views of perception i'm against the the essential representationalism and also naive realism that I mentioned earlier, both have the feature that they somehow forge a connection between the mind and the world beyond it, the external world, through perception. In their view, perception is somehow essentially world involving. Perception incorporates features of the world beyond the mind in itself and so provides a bridge between the mind and the world and then many people think that uh, that's going to give us a good account of how we get to know about the world how we can think about it how we can have justified beliefs about it and they think that consciousness plays a crucial crucial role in in in, in constructing this bridge between the mind and the world i I'm not moved by any of that at all. I'm a simple-minded reliabilist in epistemology. I think that uh, our beliefs are, are good enough contact with the world uh, and our perceptions if they're true and we're pretty well enough organized if we're constructed in such a way that in general uh, our perceptions and beliefs are true and uh, for us sophisticated humans uh, we take pains to make sure that we're so constructed because we, we uh, arrange devices and put ourselves under discipline and use instruments that help ensure that our beliefs and perceptions are generally true about the world. And I think we can tell the whole story about how we successfully managed to, to uh, understand the world. Uh, without bringing any special magic of consciousness putting us in direct contact with the world at all. And so I don't have all these epistemological concerns that move many of the people in the philosophy of perception. So uh, I say in the book, look, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just going to focus on what's going on in perception sensory experience itself. I'm not going to talk about all these other epistemological issues that that move other people in this area. Uh, I say I'll talk about them when relevant, but it doesn't, to my mind, become relevant very, very often. But I don't argue these epistemological issues in the book. I just, I just go ahead and try and understand what's the structure of sensory experience. Mm -hmm. So you've already talked about naive realism and representationalism. Are there any other positions that you also criticize in the book and that would be relevant to this discussion? Well, there's a sense datum theory that uh, was traditionally one of the competitors. It has a few defenders left today, but not many. I talk about it briefly, and I, I point out that the, the main 
difficulty. Just to backtrack a bit, not, I mean, my view is not that different from the sense data view. Some people looking at it will say, no, no why isn't the sense data view? You've got kind of uh, things inside the head. They have no essential contact with what's beyond. Uh, that's what your conscious sensory experience consists of. Uh, and uh, why are you so different from sense datum theories? But the big difference for me is that the sense datum theories thought that there were special objects inside your consciousness that you were aware of when you had sensory experience. And these were things that had ordinary worldly properties like being square or yellow or something. So if you hallucinated a yellow square, when there wasn't a real yellow square physical outside, you the sense datum theory said, well, somehow in your mind is a thing that really has the properties of yellowness and squareness. And mm -hmm. the trouble with sense datum theories is that when we look at reality from a scientific point of view, there ain't any such things. I mean, there might be the sense experiences themselves, uh, neural states and so on, but they aren't themselves square, the experiences aren't square. So, so the sense of theory has posited these objects that seem to have no physical reality. And I mean, they flourished in a time when physicalism was not, was not the uh, generally accepted view it is now within philosophy. I mean, I talked about, we talked about that last time, I think that, that while mm -hmm. Developments in 20th century science make physicalism very difficult to avoid. And that, I think, is the basic difficulty for sense datum theories. And my view isn't that in sensory experience where somehow our minds are focused on the intrinsic experiences that we have. That's not my view at all. In sensory experiences, our minds are focused on the external world. We have the sensory experiences. They're like something for us, but we're not thinking about the sensory experiences. We're not focusing our mind on the sensory experience. We're using the sensory experiences to focus our minds on the external world. So while there's some superficial similarities between my view and the sense datum view, my view is different, and I think the sense datum view has to be dismissed. Mm -hmm. And you name your view the qualitative view of sensory experience. Yes, yes. I mean, it's not a hugely catchy title, but I, you know, I, I've uh, I been working on this book for some while, and I kept changing what to call the view. And uh, I think at one point it was the the non-relational view, also not very catchy. And then I had the typographic view by the, because of the analogy with words, but that seemed to have various implications I didn't want. So. I just settled for this pretty neutral term, the qualitative view. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, the, the, the term I like, and let, let's, let's make a push right now to try and make this the, the standard term. So early on in the book, I, I contrast my view with the view of Ned Block and Chris Peacock and other people in the philosophy perception who advocate qualia. And uh, Ned Block talks about mental paint. And so Block's view is that in our experience, we have representations of shapes and so on. So he's a representationist half the time. But he thinks in addition, there's some features of our experience that aren't to do with what's represented, but to do with how the representation is being done. And he calls those paint properties. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so these are experiential properties that don't represent, that are non-relational and so on. And uh, okay, those are just the kind of properties I think experience consists of. But when Bloch thinks that experiences have, have some paint properties, I say, no, no, it's all paint. There aren't any of the represented features in experience at all. All you get is is the properties of the vehicle, the paint properties. So some people have started calling my view the pure paint view, the pure paint view. So I like that. So we can we can call my view the pure paint. There's nothing there's nothing in experience but paint. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, talking about other things now, would your view have anything to say about how we form concepts? Not really. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what concepts are. Uh, mm. It's a much disputed term. So Ruth Millikan, a uh, wonderful philosopher whom I've learned a lot, her last book is, is Beyond Concepts. She doesn't like the way people think when they think in terms of concepts. But look, I guess when we have thoughts, not perceptions, but thoughts, I guess they're composed of elements, like words in the language of thought. And, and we can call those things concepts, if you like. But I mean, Millikan's idea is, look, we've got the words, and it's a bit odd to talk about words as concepts. Concepts are the things that words express. So we've got the words, and they're not really concepts. And then we've got the things the words refer to, their reference. Mm -hmm. And she's not sure we need anything more. And for many philosophers, concepts are something that somehow add significance to the words and point them to the reference. And, and I'm not sure that we really need to bring that, bring that in. Mm -hmm. uh, the issues, I mean, not really worrying about the, the nature of concepts, as I have in my last couple of remarks, but issues about uh, what elements feature in cognitive thought, how far are they derived from and tied to the kinds of elements that get deployed in sensory experience. Uh, strong empiricist view is that you have no no ideas that you can deploy in thought that are not copies of previous impressions, i.e. things that happened in direct sensory experience. Hume's view. Uh, uh, I don't really say anything very much about that in the book. At one point, I expressed some pretty empiricist thoughts that uh, elements of experience can be redeployed in thought. I don't think that exhausts thought, but I think uh, uh, I don't think there's a bigger gap between experiences thought as many people many people think. But it's not it's it's not an important feature of the book. In fact, as I say at that point, what I say about that that elements of experience can be redeployed in thought is is not it's optional extra to the the main thesis I'm defending in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, last time we talked about consciousness. Does your view have anything to say about the nature of consciousness? No. Nope. Uh, I think I say somewhere in the book, I'm not going to talk about what makes a state conscious, what it is to be conscious. Uh, the book's all pretty neutral, neutral on that. Well, except I do, I think, refute one rather popular account of what makes states conscious, namely the representational account. Uh, well, we should backtrack a bit. Uh, we were talking about the representationalists in the philosophy of perception, and they're people who think that the conscious nature of sensory experiences and the representational content of sensory experiences are effectively one and the same thing. So I have a sensory experience, it's representing that there's a blue car there, that's its representational content, it has a certain conscious character, it feels a certain way for me to have that kind of shape and that kind of, kind of color in my experience. So there's how the experience feels, it's what it says about the world. And the representationists think those are pretty much the same thing, that you can read off from what it's saying, how it feels, and you can read off from how it feels what it says. But there's two different and, in fact, diametrically opposed programs that end up endorsing that uh, identity of conscious character, conscious feeling, 
and representational content. And they're the people who want to explain consciousness, at least in the first instance, sensory consciousness, in terms of representation. In a book I call them the naturalist representations. Michael Ty and Fred Gretzky are the, the leading exponents. And they, they have a theory of representation that's rather like mine to do with uh, the internal states being correlated with the environment and so on. And then they want to say that once you have representation like that, plus perhaps a couple of add-ons, then you're going to have consciousness. So they're going to explain consciousness and why the experience feels like it does in terms of the fact that it's, it's representing where representing is explained uh, in, in naturalist terms. So that's one account of consciousness. Okay, just hold that there because I'll mention now that the people who in the philosophy of perception do it the other way. I call them the phenomenal intentionalists. And they go the other way. They're trying to explain representation in terms of consciousness. They think all this kind of naturalist story about representation being to do with correlations, that's all not real representation. And they think the way to understand representation is to look at the structure of consciousness which they don't explain, they take for granted, but they take it that you can identify it, acquaint yourself with it by introspection. And they say, well, once you look at the structure of consciousness and appre appreciate the kind of structure it has, rather a phenomenological idea, well, then you will see how representation works. So they explain representation in terms of consciousness. Uh, but as I said, the, the naturalist intention, representationists do the other way around. They explain consciousness in terms of representation. They think that how the conscious states feel and how they're representing the world to be is the same thing. And so we can explain, explain consciousness in that way. And I say, no, that's wrong. That's not going to work. Uh, the, the conscious properties can't possibly be the same as the representational properties, and I have various arguments for that. So I have one negative thing to say about theories of consciousness. Representationalist theories of consciousness are, are no good. But uh, beyond that, I offer no positive theories of consciousness. I offer no special specification of what states are conscious, what aren't. I just say I'm interested in those conscious states that are our sensory experiences. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there any distinction between sensory experiences and thoughts? Oh, uh, clearly there is. Clearly there is. Clearly I can see my blue car outside the window and I can close my eyes and think. Maybe I can just imagine or perhaps I can believe that my blue car is outside the window. And while they uh, are two mental states that are saying the same thing about the world, they're clearly very different in nature. And uh, it's a very interesting issue in the philosophy of mind to explain what really is the principal difference between sensory experiences and thoughts. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I, I don't pause to offer any positive theory about that in the book. I talk about it a bit because I do clearly need to distinguish between sensory experiences and thoughts. Uh, there are various ways people try and do it. Some of them say, look, and I'm, experiences have a much richer phenomenology than thoughts, lots more detail. That's, that's the difference. But it's not clear all sensory experiences are so rich or all thoughts are so impoverished. So that's that's tricky. Some people say that it's to do with thoughts being conceptualized. We talked about that earlier, being kind of structured by having elements like words in a sentence and and perception not being like that. But again, I'm not so sure that can be done so easily. Uh, I think I think experiences are 
are quite structured too, uh, maybe in different ways, but it's not clear there's a sharp divide there. Uh, myself, I rather like the idea that, that experiences are, are more passive. I mean, the world forces itself on you in experience. You've got your eyes open, you can't stop yourself having visual experience. Uh, when it comes to, to cognition, it's much more a matter of something we, we do. Uh, uh, we deliberate, we form views, we form judgments, we're responsible for what happens to us in thought in a way we're not responsible for what happens to us in, in perception. So that's, that's the way I'd, I'd be inclined to draw the difference in the end. But, but while I, I do need to use the distinction in the book, and I talk a bit about various ways of drawing the distinction, I don't specially commit myself to any, any particular uh, account of the difference. I say, look, I need the difference, but I don't need to, to proceed to give you an account of the difference. Mm -hmm. Do you also address the question, what counts as an object? An object of perception, you mean? Mm -hmm. so, yes. Uh, yes, well, I talk quite a lot about intentional objects and quasi-objects. And uh, so the, for me, most the objects of perception are just ordinary physical objects like cars and so on. And, and when I'm hallucinating a car, then I say there's no object of my perception. And I'm pretty simple-minded about, about that. But there are lots of complications and temptations here, and I talk about that quite a lot in the book. So people in philosophy talk about intentional objects quite a lot. This goes with the idea that, that when I'm hallucinating, still there's something my experience is about, isn't there? I mean, the kind of scene car. Uh, or when I'm thinking about Santa Claus or Sherlock Holmes, there's something I'm thinking about. Uh, and I just slipped into a way of talking that commits me to saying, look, some of the things people think about don't exist. So now I'm, I'm committing myself to some entities that don't exist. And... Uh, it's a perfectly natural way of talking to say that some of the things people think about don't exist, but if you take what I say literally, I'm, I'm referring to some things and then saying they don't exist. Uh, those are intentional objects. Uh, when people describe what experiences or thoughts are about, they're not about anything real, they still want to say they're about something, they have intentional objects. And I talk about that a bit in the book, and I say that's... Uh, seems to me a somewhat technical issue to do with uh, the analysis of our talk about beliefs and perceptions. What do we mean when we say it's about, about something uh, when there's no object there? Uh, and I say I'm not especially against the idea of these non-existent intentional objects. I'm not particularly keen on them, but uh, I don't want to fight any battles about that. But the battle I do want to fight is I at the same time say that one thing important about experience, sensory experience, is it has a very rich structure and it has various kinds of constancies and points of stability. This is just within the structure of our conscious experience, all intrinsic, nothing to do with the world beyond. Uh, but when you think about the structure of our experience, it has kind of... Uh, the say same shape moves around, so to speak, in our experience. There's things in our experience that are like, I mean, they're like the picture on a TV screen. It's an, an analogy I use, but I'm very careful with. But you mean, think about the objects moving around the TV screen. Uh, there mightn't be anything behind the representation. I think, well, if we have our experiences in themselves, still looking at the structure of the experience, uh, there's something like an object there. I call it a quasi-object. But I think an awful lot of the difficulties in the philosophy of perception come when people run together the quasi-objects in your experience with these kind of technical 
intentional objects that we need to bring in to understand what hallucinatory thoughts or experiences are about. I, I don't know, it took me a long time to think about this issue because it's a terribly tricky issue and I mean I was first introduced to the idea of intentional objects in philosophy as an undergraduate and it never kind of made sense what's going on. Uh, it's a term that comes from the phenomenological tradition but I now think I've, I've got good sense of it. There's these kind of the need to make sense of our talk about thoughts about non-existent objects, and that's okay. And then there's the stable features of our sensory experience, and that's okay, of course they're there. But if you try and identify the two things, you get in a terrible mess. So I talk a lot about a very fine paper by, by the sadly late Brian Law, one of his last papers, a wonderful paper, uh, and he says, look, think about the case where you're hallucinating uh, a yellow lemon, right? And he says there's this feature of your experience. And you can say, look, there's that yellow lemon. And then at the same time, you think, well, maybe it exists, maybe it doesn't exist. And, and if it exists, well, then, then I'm seeing... The real, the real lemon. If it doesn't exist, well then, then I'm not seeing a real lemon, but uh, at least uh, there's this intentional object in my experience. But now we've gone wrong, because the intentional object, the thing that might or might not exist depending on how the world is beyond you, is not the same as that element of your experience, which is there whether or not you're hallucinating, because that exists for sure. And that's just a mistake to think the element of your experience, which definitely exists, is an intentional object that might or might not exist. But people are very tempted to say, that thing I'm sure is there in my experience, might or might not exist. And then they get into all kinds of tangles because they think, well, that thing that's in my experience, for all I know, does exist, in which case it's a real lemon and it has properties of lemons like being lemon shaped and being yellow and so on. So even if it doesn't exist, it's still there. And so it still has the properties of lemon shaped and uh, yellowness. Uh, and that's an idea that nearly everybody has, and I think it's just a mistake. Your experience isn't lemon-shaped. Nothing in your experience is lemon-shaped. Nothing in your experience is really yellow. So we haven't talked about this, but, but the thought that drives many people in the philosophy of perception, uh, both the representationists I'm against and the naive realists, is that when you introspect your experience, you can become aware, you become aware of what I call worldly properties, properties like being lemon shaped and being square that are, uh, are present in your experience. When you introspect, you can see that in your experience is the property of being lemon shaped, being, being you know, the kind of properties that, that physical objects can have. And then the, the naive realist thinks that shows that, that your, your experiences relate to properties uh, instantiated in front of you. The representationists think your sensory experience uh, uh, represents certain worldly properties uh, as possibly being instantiated in front of you, but anyway, the properties are there in your experience. And I think that's just a terrible mistake. I don't understand how in the case where I'm hallucinating, the property of yellow, which is nowhere around, I mean, there's no yellow lemon, I'm not yellow, my brain's not yellow, still the property of yellow some, somehow in your experience. And that's that's the idea I really focus on as, as uh, making representationalism uh, incoherent. But it stems from the idea that the thing in my experience that I can introspect, the, I can only describe it as the apparent lemon, 
that that same thing might be a real lemon or might not be. And uh, that's the idea I think makes no, no good sense. Mm -hmm. So one last topic. By answering these questions in the metaphysics of sensory experience we've mm -hmm. been talking about, do they have any implications for other questions in metaphysics more generally? I'm not sure about implications for metaphysics. Uh, it's rather the other way around. I mean, I, I think that the standard views of perception of sensory experience make no metaphysical sense. That's, that's why the book has this title. I, I criticize alternative views and defend my own view in the philosophy of perception on the grounds that those other views are metaphysically incoherent and my view is the only view that makes any metaphysical sense. If you also, does that conclusion have implications for the rest of metaphysics? I think perhaps not obviously. Does it have any implications for, I don't know, realism about universals or uh, persistence of objects over time or I don't know, classic examples of metaphysical issues. Not really, but I do think it has strong issues, implications for issues in epistemology and, and the theory of meaning generally. Mm -hmm. So uh, we mentioned earlier that many people uh, think that the route to knowledge to justify beliefs about the external world is via conscious sensory experience because of its special mind world bridging powers. And I think I say no, a proper understanding of the nature of sensory experience is going to undermine undermine those projects. I mean I don't I don't argue that in the book, but it's pretty it's pretty pretty clear. Uh, uh, some people think and these are the, the phenomenal intentionalists that uh, we can understand the nature of representation in general. How is it possible for one thing to be about another? How is it possible for, for one state to lay claim to some further condition in the world? They think the way to understand that is via understanding the, the metaphysical structure of conscious experience. And again, I say that's not going to work either. So I go from metaphysics of experience to conclusions about uh, epistemology and, and the nature of representation intentionality. Uh, so it's not quite metaphysical implications, but it is philosophical implications, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So let's end the interview here. Uh, again, the book is The Metaphysics of Sensory Experience. Uh, just before we go, would you like to mention where people can find you on the internet? Find me or find the book or find both? Uh, uh, both. You and your work. Uh, my, uh, my website is... Uh, uh, what is it? It's david.papano.co.uk. Or maybe uh, I, I think so, yes. It's not just davidpapineau.co.uk. Well, it's one or the other. Uh, so try David Papineau with or without a full stop.co.uk. That's my website. And the book's just out a week ago, The Metaphysics of Sensory Experience. And uh, uh, that's all I've got to say now. It's not, it's not a very big book. It's only... Uh, 160 pages, there's a lot packed in, so you uh, uh, can read it in a pleasant evening. Okay, great. So I will be leaving links to all of that in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Papineau, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for taking the time to come on the show. Good. Thank you for having me on. That was fun. 
Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting it on Patreon or PayPal. All of the links are in the description box of the interview. This show is brought to you by people like you, so consider doing it. Otherwise, and if you like the interview, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Pauline Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervoz, Bo Weingart, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, Jorge Spigny, Phil Kavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Nguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omer Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslo Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. João Weira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Des Araújo, Ethan Solon, Romain Roach, Dimitri Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adan Ruzmani, Charlotte Bliss, Miran B, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazevsky, Max Belby, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz. My producers is Arweba Jim, Frank Lucas Stafinia, Kian Gilligan, Sergio Codreano, Luis Caetano, Tom Van Egdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardos France, and Nirvan Balachandran. And my executive producers, Michel Rogeski, Rosie, James Pratt, and Matthew Lavender. Thank you for all.